Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a ratings and review. If you'd like to see detailed show notes and a complete transcript, please go to my website, drwhites.com. And if you'd like to see a video version of this podcast, go to my YouTube page, White's Cairo. So our topic for today is osteoporosis and bone health. And our special guest is Dr. Lanny Simpson. Osteoporosis, according to the International Osteoporosis Foundation, literally means porous bone. And it's a disease in which the density and quality of bone are reduced. As bones become more porous and fragile, the risk of fracture greatly increases. The loss of bone occurs silently and progressively, and often there are no symptoms until the first fracture occurs. Worldwide, one in three women over the age of 50 and one in five men will experience osteoporotic fractures sometime in their life. Osteoporosis and low bone mass are currently estimated to be a major public health threat for almost 44 million U.S. women and men age 50 and older. Overall, 80%, 75%, 70%, and 58% of forearm, humerus, hip, and spine fractures occur in women, especially women over the age of 65. A 10% loss of bone mass in the spine could double the risk of spinal fractures. And a 10% loss of bone mass in the hip can result in two and a half times the risk of hip fractures. And breaking a hip can be particularly disastrous as 24% of those who break a hip will die within the next 12 months. Dr. Lanny Simpson is a doctor of chiropractic and a certified clinical densitometrist. She's the author of Dr. Lanny's No-Nonsense Bone Health Guide, The Truth About Density Testing, Osteoporosis Drugs, and Building Bone Quality at Any Age, which is going to be the focus of most of our talk today, and of Dr. Lanny's No-Nonsense Sun Health Guide, The Truth About Vitamin D, Sunscreen, Sensible Sun Exposure, and Skin Cancer. And by the way, after this podcast gets posted, any of the listeners if you go to the show notes, there'll be a discount to purchase um, both of these books. Dr. Lanny is also the co-founder of the East Bay Menopause and PMF Center and of the East Bay Osteoporosis Diagnostic Center. Most importantly for us, Dr. Simpson is the most knowledgeable doctor I know about bone health and osteoporosis. Thank you for joining us today. That's great to be here. It's great to see you too. <laughs> Good, good, good. So um, how much does the standard American diet and our sedentary lifestyle contribute to our risk of osteoporosis? A lot. <laughs> so uh, in my, uh, just to give you a little brief in terms of my own situation and why I ended up with di diagnosed with osteoporosis, I was diagnosed in my mid-40s. I'm 71 now. I've never taken a bone drug. So why is that? So we have to look at a lot of things. But one of the reasons I ended up with osteoporosis was not what I was doing in my 40s, but what I did and didn't do in my teens. Because we build up 80% of our lifetime bone mass by the time we're 18. And there's still some building that goes on until we're around 30 years old. So I didn't do that time well. I started smoking at the age of 12. I was drinking, doing drugs. I mean, I did a lot of things. In fact, it's amazing my bones are as good as they are. But I stopped all that nasty stuff by the time I was about 21, and I got a clue. Now, I've never sustained a fracture, so why is that? So I've had I have osteoporosis, I've had it for years, still do. And um, there, the reason I haven't fractured, some of it's genetics, some of it is uh, just the fact that I'm, I've also been eating really well since the age of 21. My, 
bone health, I think, has been pretty darn good because I eat well. I, uh, you know, have nuts. You know, don't eat uh, infl inflammatory foods. Don't drink alcohol. I mean, I live a really clean life now, and so that helps boost bone quality. So there's two things in terms of this. Well, there's a lot of stuff that's involved with the strength of bone. Again, genetics plays a role. Um, <clears throat> having good density and also bone quality. So quality means there's still some flexibility. And uh, even and I'm very athletic at my age. And I took a very bad fall a couple years ago where I wrenched my ankle worse than I ever have. And I thought for sure I'd fractured. I didn't fracture. So it just says that there, there's a lot to this bone stuff. And um, I, I work with people every week. I have, by the way, I have a group over on uh, Facebook that's a free group. It's called uh, Dr. Lonnie's uh, uh, Osteoporosis Myths and Facts. I have about 4,000 people over there. Okay. Uh, but I deal with fractures every day, and uh, it's so preventable. And, and if I may just say one more thing. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I'm trying to really educate people about is the loss of bone that women are going to incur at menopause. Their doctors don't tell them. And then I end up, they end up coming to me in their late 50s. And all of a sudden, they've lost an additional 20, sometimes 20%. Women can lose 20% of their bone density between in that five year, five to seven years post menopause. And then let's say you add to this, Dr. White's, a vitamin D deficiency and going through menopause or digestive issues and going through menopause. Those are going to be the high losers. So, diagnosis of osteoporosis doesn't mean you're losing. We can talk about that in a minute actively, but I can tell you during that time for women, they are actively losing bone. Now, you know, one of the things you, you mentioned, which is that um, bone density, which is one of the main tests to assess bone health, is a measure of the amount of bone, but it doesn't actually uh, tell us that much about the bone flexibility or the bone quality. And uh, it's too bad that I, I don't believe there's really a good test for that. Oh, no, there is. Uh, let, me, let me tell you about okay. that. Okay. So, okay. So there's um, bone density. And if we're talking uh, T-scores here, because that's how it's measured. So if you've got a T-score of negative one, negative two. So negative, maybe, well, maybe, maybe you can explain what a bone density test is. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, no, right. It's so uh, a bone density test is you go in and they take some, um, well, why don't you explain exactly what a bone density test is? Okay. So uh, it's very simple as you're about to point out and uh, you go in, there's no, uh, cause a lot of times people think it's something invasive. It's not, they're on a table uh, and it takes about 20 minutes to do a bone density. Typically doctors order the spine and when they do order the spine, they only are getting uh, L1 to L4. The reason for that is, is because the lower spine doesn't have ribs over it and the pelvis over it, so they can get a clear shot. So that's why we do L1 to L4. And then they do the femur, or what's known as the hip, and um, in two areas. So they'll look at the neck of the femur and what we call the total hip area, which is more of an area. So any one of those areas, you're diagnosed with osteoporosis, you have osteoporosis, okay? It's not like you have osteoporosis in one area and not another, typically. Sometimes you can have it in, say, an arm from a disused thing or something like that, but typically it's systemic. And you can also do the forearm. I always order the forearm, by the way, Doc, in addition to the hip and the spine. Now, the other test for the bone quality. What's the advantage of ordering the forearm? Well, there's a lot of information I can get. So when I'm looking at bone densities, I'm looking at nuances. I'm looking at the images, kind of like a small x-ray and all that. Um, so what the forearm gives me is the, uh, uh, the wrist measurement. And the diagnosis, though, for osteoporosis in the, or bone density in the forearm is the mid-forearm. That's compact bone. Now, compact bone, up until you're 65, should be good. Anyone who uses their arms, right? I had a case this week. She had a negative 3.5, which is, if we're just looking at numbers, I'll, I'll talk percentages, um, about 45% less bone density than an average 30-year-old. She shouldn't have that. This woman is athletic. Right. Why did she have it? Because she has a condition called primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, what does that do? It goes after compact bone. 
But also, this is another area for me to look at uh, co uh, combination bone, mostly uh, uh, cancellous bone. So let's say, for instance, you've got arthritis in the spine. You're going to have a, uh, a false negative reading, meaning you're going to have, the, it's going to show more, it's going to look like you have more bone density in the spine because you have osteoarthritis. Ah, because so you have these bone spurs yeah. and... That's right. So for me, when I'm at analyzing a case, when I'm looking at bone, I'm looking at very carefully at bone density, and I can tell you that, frankly, they're wrong most of the time. There's errors. I find them almost on every case. Uh, it's, it's stunning, but people do not have to be trained and be in these facilities. It's just, even the doctors, it's just... So you say in their report that comes with the bone density test is not giving you the most accurate information all the I'm time. I'm telling you that, well, in fact, there's two videos that are on YouTube about this. Um, yeah, I'm saying to you, and especially the hip, the hip measurement is commonly incorrect. And here's where we get into trouble is when you do comparisons, because just the rotation of the hip can cause a 7% difference. And then the doctor says, oh my God, you've lost 7%. In the last year, you need to do a bone drug when they haven't actually lost. So it, there's a lot about this bone business, but I want to go back for a moment just to tell you about the bone quality test. It's called trabecular bone score. Now, that means cancellous bone. So what they're going to be doing is looking. Uh, they can do this. Um, uh, it's done on a bone density machine, but not very many places have it. Kaiser doesn't have it. We're in California and they don't have it. The reason they don't is because it costs $10,000 to buy the software to give them this information. There's also a video on um, YouTube that I did where I interviewed uh, the Swedish doctor who developed this software. And what I can tell you, Dr. Weitz, is that when I look at bone density, I take history, I question thoroughly about fractures if they've had them. Um, and I look at that bone quality. Then I feel prepared to make decisions. And you've got a lot of people in the gray area. Does someone need a medication or not? The answer to that is medications are, are needed by some people for sure. And then which ones? I mean, there's a lot, again, there's a lot to think about. And the full lab workup is very extensive. I've really been enjoying this discussion. But now I'd like to pause to tell you about the sponsor for this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Pure Encapsulations, which is one of the few lines of professional nutritional supplements that I use in my office. Pure Encapsulations manufactures a complete line of hypoallergenic, research-based dietary supplements. Pure products are meticulously formulated using pure, scientifically tested and validated ingredients. They are free from magnesium stearate, gluten, GMOs, hydrogenated fats, artificial colors, sweeteners, and preservatives. Among other things, one of the great things about Pure Encapsulations is not just the quality products, but the fact that they often provide a range of different dosages and sizes, which makes it easy to find the right product for the right patient, especially since we do a lot of testing and we figure out exactly what the patients need. So for example, with DHEA, they offer 5, 10, and 25 milligram dosages in both 60 and 180 capsules per bottle size, which is extremely convenient. Um, and now, back to our discussion. You want to talk about what a full lab workup is for a patient? Uh, okay, so let's say, issues? well, of course, if somebody comes in, well, everyone pretty much who finds me has osteoporosis. That they've had a bone density, they come to me, right? And, uh, and beyond and, bone, and on a bone densitometry, bone densitometer test, um, that's a T score of minus two point five or greater. Yeah. So, so or lower, you would say actually. Or lower. So negative okay. two point five. That each standard deviation is about twelve percent. So you're looking at about thirty percent less bone density than an average thirty year old. Somebody could live their entire life with that. It, it depends on bone quality. It depends on a lot of things. But now, let's say you have a negative four. That is a whole different story. You are not going to reverse that despite what you see on, uh, on the internet about OsteoStrong or a lot of these companies that are putting out false information. Um, you are not going to be able to reverse that. 
and you can make you can like you got a 60 year old person you don't have the advantage of you know bone building hormones that are happening all the time you know you got a 60 year old person you're not going to reverse osteoporosis at that level you can maybe halt it here's who i can halt it in people who are having what we call normal age related loss which i don't really like that term but that's 0.5 to 1% a year but th- think about this dr wise just add just add that up over 10 years so that somebody is not exercising because they just don't um, or they can only do somewhat because they've got a foot problem or a knee problem. I mean, you get my point here. Oh, I've heard that plenty of times. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Yeah, so, so they're not, the they, will, they will lose, and especially the small women. Are yes. Going to lose. They are going to lose. So, uh, by, by the anyway. way, I think maybe before we get to the um, lab testing, why don't we, since we've been talking about bone density tests, why don't we go over some of the issues with bone density tests first? Sure, you want to go there? <laughs> Well, um, yeah. as you were mentioning, like the positioning era, and um, so um, what What are some of the important things about the way the person gets positioned about um, yeah. the bone density test? Well, and- I advise people get my book, and in the book it says, it tells you how to, what to say when you go in, to try to get the best bone density. I mean, one of the things I, I tell people to say is, uh, I, I, my doctor suggests that you, Make sure, you know, really make sure you've got that hip rotation right. So you put them on the, oh, somebody's paying attention, you know. So, so they're positioned on a table and their legs are supposed to be against something and then their feet are supposed to be rotated a certain yeah. degree. This is right? all in slightly, my, this is all, yeah, this slightly is all in my book, in, right? If you can. Sometimes you can't rotate people. But yeah, again, this is all pictured in my book and all the highly recommended. So you're not going to get that whole picture from this discussion, but that's do, it. Yes. Do all the labs have that positioning? Um, they have it. Do they use it? Oh, okay. <laughs> when you, when, if you're doing things quickly, you, you, a lot of times they don't use it. And here's the thing, again, to really get the, the technicians most often have not been trained. It's not required. The doctors are not required to be trained. And even the radiologists who do this lack training. So they don't even know how to interpret. So I believe you said that the hips are supposed to be like internally rotated 15 degrees. 15 degrees. Yeah. And, it, and they have a little thing that you, that you put your feet in. When you're on your back, although a lot of places don't do this, I prefer it this way, but it depends on the type of machine. There's GE Lunar, there's Hologic, there's Norland. Uh, most common is Hologic and GE Lunar, but... I like it best, and Hologic typically does this, when they put your knees, your uh, lower leg up, so that your, you know, your legs are like, like that. Right, 90 okay. degree angle. And that flattens the spine to the table. And that's going to get a more, because a lot of times when they don't do that, what you see is the lumbar arch. vertebra, yeah. we see the lumbar vertebra <clears throat> half the size because it's overlapping L5. Right. And then, let's say the next time they have a bone density test, the person didn't do that. Well, what the, the density is going? The comparison's wrong. Wow. See my point? Yeah. So it's there's there's, there's a lot of very subtle positioning differences yes. that can change your results. Uh, the results will change if you're in a different machine. Um, so therefore go into the same lab, but even if you go to the same lab, they, they might put you in a different machine. Well, you want to ask good question. So yes, Kaiser does this a lot. Um, you, when you go in, say, I'd like to be put on the same machine. They may have it right in the room and still not put you on the same machine because when you don't are not on the same machine, you can have two to three to 5% difference just based on the machine itself how often it was um, uh, what do you calibrated call it? calibrated yes uh, finish my sentences at any time I appreciate it. <laughs> I do actually at this point I used to hate people like that now they're my best friend anyway, so um, yeah you just you, you you've just got to kind of do the best you can with this uh, getting through this uh, and, and and but I hi, again our bones we all have to get through this lifetime with pretty good bones I mean that's the name of the game. I mean, you want physical independence. That's what we want. And, now, that, yeah, and uh, as you point out, those hip fractures change a person's life. 
It might not kill them, but you know that a lot of times the hip, it's, the, the leg length may be different. A lot of different things can happen. So when you're looking at the um, report, the analysis of the DEXA bone scan, um, the um, T-score is comparing them to a 30-year-old, correct? Yes, and that's correct. And um, so, you, and then what is the Z-score and, and how, Z, okay. how Z important is the T-score versus the Z-score? Okay, so, okay. I've, I've kind of been trained to just look at the T-score, but... It, no, that's correct, except, okay, so... Um, uh, women post menopause, regardless of age, you look at T score. Women prior to menopause, Z score. Men after the age of 50, T score. Before that, Z score. I don't always pay attention to those hard lines because I, I know how to look at all this stuff. Um, but th the reason they have it like that is because that's what's been studied. So the T, did we just describe what the T score is? What's the Z score? It's age matched, so you're okay. it's still it's still the same difference, and but you're you're now looking at age match. So then a lot of people say, oh well, it makes much more sense to uh, do an age match. I'm 60 years old. I'm not 30. Well, I don't know if I I, I don't want to be measured up against the average 60 year old. I want to see how far I've come from an average 30 year old. Right. Now let me give you another interesting tidbit. I'm five foot six, but my wrist size is five inches. I have tiny bones. So I'm not, my wrist size is not an average 30 year old. You can have, and that's about six inches. Okay. So some of my bone density is a, what we call false positive. I didn't lose it. And this is why I was saying earlier, having that diagnosis of osteoporosis does not mean you're actively losing. But anyway, I didn't, I didn't gain it simply because my bones are smaller. And that's about maybe 8 to 10% in my case. That said, smaller bones are at higher risk for fracture because they're just smaller. Right. So I can jump just for a moment to lab tests if you want me to now because we're talking about okay. active bone loss. Sure. Or, yeah. do want, or, do you, or do you want to finish up or do you have any other questions there? Um, on the bone densitometry? Um, well, let's see. What else do we want to talk about? So what does the Z-score, uh, so Z-score, you're comparing someone uh, of the same age. Uh, so what if there's a discrepancy between the T-score and the Z-score? Well, there's not, there's, you know, it depends on the age, but you're not going to see much a lot of times, like say if a woman is 30 and you look at the T and the Z, it's going to be pretty, pretty similar. But again, um, as we get older, that shift is going to happen between that T score is going to be lower than the, you know, the Z score. So, cause Z score, so if you have a 60 year old woman, the Z score could look normal, but if you look at that T score, it's going to show her well into, into osteoporosis. And so anything um, greater than minus or less than minus 1.5, we consider low bone density or um, uh, osteopenia. And then well, osteopenia is a misnomer. It, it's kind of, it was never meant to be a diagnosis. So okay. negative one to negative 2.4 is osteopenia. If you want to, okay. some people negative still call that. Negative yeah, or low bone density. Okay. Now uh, I did a whole webinar just on this topic of gray area. Because I also have a lot of patients, Dr. Weitz, that have normal bone density and fracture. And what does that say? That says several things, that it could just be their bone quality is that poor. So some people can have good density, but the quality of it is, it's like a piece of chalk, you know, it can break. It's dense, but it can break. So, <clears throat> uh, but that said, the most typical thing I see when people start breaking and and uh, is low bone density and low, and, and often they're going to have poor bone quality and a TBS score if I can get it. Because in California, we can typically find a place, but it can be hard to find. So essentially, when, they, when we send them for the bone density scan, we ask for, what do we ask for? To we want to ask, well, first of all, the doctor has to be on board and a lot of them aren't. A lot of them do not value the TBS score. I can tell you that that tide is beginning to shift. Like I'm in a group of 100, um, probably more than that, uh, top 
phone doctors in the country. And boy, do they use it if they have it, you know, because it just adds to the picture. And how, hey, if the patients have to pay extra for it, how much <laughs> it, is it an expensive uh, addition? The doctor's still going to have to order it. It's not covered by insurance and it's a, up to maybe $150. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, we, I, I ordered bone density tests all the now, time. Now here's another thing for people to know. If you don't have insurance, don't get a bone density test at a hospital. They can cost you as much as twelve hundred bucks, and other places it's three hundred. So, oh, so go to an outside lab rather than a hospital. An outside imaging facility, and yeah. you might want to ask, you know, are you ISCD certified? Probably not, but uh, that's my governing body, the International Society of Clinical Densitometry, and if they've been trained that way, you're likely to get a better uh, uh, technique. Doesn't mean. You're not going to get someone that's pretty good because, you know, if, if they're really good, they've actually studied what they're doing. They've read the book. I mean, you know, you can see it. It's right there in the books. But training helps, as you know. I mean, it's sort of like learning chiropractic from books. It's different. Now, if you get a patient who has a, a conventional x-ray that shows uh, a loss of bone, what, is, what does that mean? Oh, that's osteoporosis. It's not osteopenia. For you to see that on x-ray, and that's a very good point. Anytime on x-ray the word osteopenia is on the diagnosis. That is not osteopenia, it's osteoporosis. Because you can't, in order to see anything in terms of bone, on an x-ray you have to have about 40%, if not more, less bone density, notice I'm not saying loss, but less bone density to be able to see it on x-ray. So it's missed on x-ray a lot, but that term is, as you know, has been used since we were in school and, uh, uh, it, but it, it doesn't reflect really what the truth is. So bottom line, if you see an x-ray of the spine or whatever it is, and you see a loss of bone, that's really significant. It's not, there's no way it's just a small minor. Oh, no, it's, it's a big deal. Okay. So let's go into the, um, in, into the lab testing for a full workup for somebody <clears throat> with osteoporosis or bone loss. Okay, well, we could be here for a long time. Okay, so maybe some of the highlights. <laughs> okay, again, there's a whole chapter about this in my book, but yeah, uh, basic right. would be um, I'm going to get a, 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 a comprehensive metabolic panel. Okay. Uh, you know, CBC, the basics. Right. Now, let's say I've got somebody who has, it really depends on how severe the case is and what's going on. Let's say the person has digestive problems. Well, right. I'm really concerned that there's probably potential uh, loss and, um, and also, uh, you know, they're just not absorbing, right? But if I've got a case, I've got one bone density, it's negative 2.5. Um, I don't know when that happened. Maybe it happened like me in my teens, I didn't gain. So therefore, I've got to order more lab tests to determine whether or not active loss is occurring. A lot of people think, and I remember when I was diagnosed, I thought I was peeing out my bone every day. I just freaked out. I wasn't actually losing at that time. So the so I do the uh, comprehensive metabolic panel 14. That's the one I order. CBC. I do um, basic urinalysis. And then uh, everyone's going to get this, a vitamin D test, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Um, typically, by the way, I also, because I my new book is a lot about vitamin D, but I also order the 125 vitamin D, and you have to know how to look at that, but the point is, I do order that right. on my osteoporosis patients. Um, and I'm going to order um, parathyroid, uh, uh, parathyroid test with calcium, so it's called intact parathyroid parathyroid intact with calcium. Okay. So an analyzing calcium levels, that's something. I'm going to get back to that in a moment. Let me okay. just give you the list. And then depending on what they say to me in terms of, because I, I take like a seven page history along, with have them write down everything they eat for a week and all that, that sure. then forms what I may do next. I might be thinking that person has thyroid disease because what people have to understand is that everything affects the bone. So I've got to do a comprehensive evaluation. You're smiling because you know what I'm talking about. That's what we call functional medicine. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so I have to look at all systems. And, uh, and as you know, in thyroid testing, they're only going to do the TSH and the total T4. 
I'm going to do free T3, free T4, TSH, total T4, total T3, and then I'm going to do uh, reverse T3, although I rarely find that, by the way. Um, and I'm going to test the uh, uh, thyroid antibody test. Because it's that important, and it's uh, the uh, third time in a woman's life where she's most likely to present with thyroid because, you know, it, it, uh, um, puberty, pregnancy, perimenopause, menopause. That's when women e express, and it's, you know, so much more common in women. And I, But I catch it in men, too, because I look for it, right? Because, you know. It's not often looked for them anyway. So thyroid's one, parathyroid. I'm going to look at the kidneys. I'm going to do a 24-hour urine. That's a basic test. And then I'm going to do bone markers. So there could be a whole bunch of other tests. These are the basics I'm giving you. But bone markers are critical. And you're going to read or hear some doctors say, oh, I don't order those. They don't mean anything. BS. And I, I, I am so tired of hearing that. And I can tell you that no top doctor who's really evaluating bone doesn't use them that I'm aware of, okay? So uh, that would be the c telopeptide or CTX is, is the best one to look at um, osteoclastic activity in terms of bone breakdown, but we're really looking at bone turnover. Um, uh, the P1NP, so those two are always going to, and osteocalcin, I'm always going to order those. Um, so osteocalcin is also gives us a sense of bone buildup. Uh, P1NP does also, but you know what? If osteocalcin is high, well, it's, it, let me just go to, I have to explain too much. The P1NP, if that's elevated or high end of normal, a lot of docs just use that. I don't agree with that. Uh, but that, that typically is used to also follow uh, anabolic medications such as Forteo and Timless because it, it, it's showing osteoblastic activity. So what I want to look at is bone turnover. So the, mo the minimum I would order with bone markers would be the CTX P1NP. And the only reason I might not order osteocalcin or the other one is because they can't afford it. But osteocalcin would be in there and also uh, an NTX, which is the least valuable, but that's what everybody orders. If they often order only one. And, and the NTX is usually by urine, is that the one? There's three. So there's a 24 hour NTX, don't do that one. There's a blood NTX. Don't do that one. The one to do is the random second catch. Now, a lot of doctors think it's the better one, but they say, well, some, a lot of women, this is true, you have to think about your patient, may have trouble actually getting the second catch. So if you've got somebody who has Parkinson's, you've got somebody who has problems with their, might not be able to get the second catch, then do one of the other ones. But what I like to do is look at all of those together. That gives me an inside look that day of the workings of the bone. They're not, you know, 100% accurate. But let's say that CTX comes in at 700D and the NTX comes in on that high, high end also. Then I know I'm looking at active loss. So basically, these markers of bone turnover are telling you, um, first you found out that you have some bone loss, and now they're telling you, right now, are you in the process of losing, gaining, or staying the same as and far they don't, as Well, they don't, they, and they don't typically look at that. If you go to Kaiser, what you're going to get is a diagnosis of osteoporosis, none of this kind of testing other than maybe the, the uh, metabolic panel. Right. Um, and you're going to be put on Fosamax for five years and told, told to come back for a bone density test in five years. That's absurd. Because in three months, if somebody does require medication, or let's say, they're, let's say they're borderline, and you say to yourself, well, this person's borderline. They've never had a fracture. You know, uh, th their, their bone markers are, are a little high. I think I can handle this with this patient because they're willing to work on nutrition and supplements and exercise. Let's see if we can bring it down. I do it all the time with people. Of course. Yeah. But let's say we have somebody who's a negative three, negative 3.5, negative four, becomes different. But there's never a time where the foundation of what I do with patients is always nutrition, gastrointestinal health, exercise, and anything else that's going on. And then when medications are needed, the right medication. And there, you know, and I can just tell you, and I used to be anti-medication, but medications, when I've seen people who are in what we call cascading 
um, fractures in the spine, one after the other. It's a scary situation. And Forteo will stop it. I mean, you know, I, or you have a pregnancy osteoporosis where women are fracturing, giving birth. I get these patients. I see them. And, and uh, Forteo, you just mentioned, is a medication that increases osteoblastic activity. It's, it's an amazing medication. But again, and I want to say this, this is after a real full valuation has been done with somebody because if secondary causes are not fixed, those are the people who say, oh, I took Forteo. It didn't do anything for me. Well, they didn't maybe fix the thyroid problem or whatever. Anyway, so, but yeah, uh, the Dr. Claude Arnault, who wrote the foreword to my book, was my mentor for 20 years. He developed Forteo, principal developer of Forteo. So I was back there actually in the 90s when this was being tested and it was, everyone was just blown away by what it was doing because it has a hat, short half-life. Like Fosamax has a half-life of 12 years. Um, Forteo, we used to think, had a half-life of seconds. But it can be minutes or hours. But the point is, a very relatively short half-life, and it goes through the body and upregulates osteoclasts and osteoblasts, both of them. So you're going to lose bone and gain bone, but the osteoblasts are going to win out. But what the end result's going to be is that it's gone after the old bone, gotten more, rid of more damaged bone, and laid down new bone. And it does a remarkable job with that. And yes, you've got to follow it with other things. I mean, you know, there's, again, it's a, uh, all of these areas are huge conversation. So for patients uh, who might be listening or practitioners who are not aware of this, um, as, as we go through our life, our, it's not just a question of you gain uh, bone up to a certain age and then after that you just lose bone. Bone is like your muscles. We're constantly in a process of losing and gaining bone and it's more of a question of the balance. So at any one point in time, we have um, osteoclasts breaking down bone that's been damaged uh, from the course of life and strain and, and et cetera. And then we have osteoblasts that are building new bone. And um, so it's really a question of that. Right. And that's, how our, that's how our bone quality stays good. Right. By getting rid of old bone, laying down new bone. And that was the mistake when they were giving the bisphosphonates like Fosamax and you know, the other drugs that we class. Yeah, so bisphosphonates is uh, the most common category of uh, prescription pharmaceutical drugs for uh, improving bone density. And um, as you mentioned, Fosamax and Actinel, and, and there's a whole series of these drugs. And, and maybe you can explain what they do and what the problem is with these drugs. Well, the, the, <coughs> what we discovered was uh, back in the 90s, um, they were giving it out like candy, you know, and they were giving it as a prevention. I have a really good video with a doctor, um, Jennifer Schneider, who's an internist, and here's her story. She was um, on a subway in New York. She'd been taking Fosamax for a long time. She's having some thigh pain. She was on it for maybe five years. And you know how when you stop on a uh, either a BART train or you know, like in New on a subway, you kind of yes. yeah, yeah. But what was even that much? It was that. But her femur snapped in half. Wow. Now, after many of those started showing up, they started getting a clue. But I'll tell you something, Doc. I predicted this back in the '90s, and I don't think it's because I'm that smart. It's because I know that what they do is go after the osteoclasts, and the osteoclasts are there for a purpose to get rid of old bone. So if you are too successful at suppressing those, you do it for too long and you're not following bone markers. I'm going back to bone markers again. You overly suppress that bone. You're not following bone markers because you don't know what the hell you're doing and what's going to happen with, for a small percentage of people, but it still happens. They're going to have more fragile bones. So why is it though? And I'll ask, ask, say this too. I've seen people who've been on it for 15 years, never had a fracture who come to me and I'm like freaked out, you know, I'll get them off, help them get off of it. But because the current, the current protocol is you should only be on a bisphosphonate for five years. Is that correct? No. Well, that's the, 
it, not my protocol, the current protocol should be with any medication, what the bone markers tell you. Okay. So you follow people with bone markers. The same thing even when they're, you're doing Forteo or uh, Prolia, which I'm not a fan of, I'm just saying. Like Prolia injections, it does the same uh, in a different way, but it goes after osteoclasts primarily. And uh, they say the, the, the recommendation by the companies do it every six months. Well, that's lazy. No, take do the bone markers. Give the injection when the bone markers, and maybe it's nine months it starts, the uh, turnover starts. But I'm not a huge fan of that. But, uh, but also I might say too that in bisphosphonates and even prolia, uh, the first year you're going to have a kick in osteoblasts. And then you're not going to have that. But there is a kick that, that does happen kind of through the back door in a way. Um, so I did want to mention that because a lot of people are unaware of that. So, and I'm not, you know, Fosamax, I, I've learned that there are appropriate times for it, uh, you know, and if you're watching bone markers and you're careful with that patient, it just depends. Maybe they can't take for or Timeless because they've had breast cancer. You know, there's, again, you've got a lot of things to think about. So your favorite drugs um, for patients with osteoporosis after you've done your nutritional protocol is Forteo and... Well, if it's clinically uh, appropriate. Right. So that my favorite drug is the one that is needed for that patient, and it could be a bisphosphonate. Um, uh, even Reclass, which is the yearly infusion. Um, but there's a way to get to that point. I would never have... I would never like to see anyone just start on reclass. I just had a patient the other day, negative 2.5. They recommended the heavy hitter without doing any bone markers or anything. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So um, there's a place for it. And, and again, it's a, a longer conversation. But there's a whole chapter of that in my book, too, about medications um, that you can get a pretty good view of. But in general, it sounds like you would prefer not to use a bisphosphonate unless that was absolutely necessary. In my perfect world, if uh, somebody, uh, it, it's not contraindicated to do an anabolic. I would prefer doing anabolic first because let's say you do it the other way around. You know, you, someone was on Fosamax and then they got put on for tail. It's not going to have as, as big of an effect. So yeah, in my perfect world, I'd want to build up the bone help that bone stay there. You're going to have to give them Fosamax or something, or even hormones, by the way, bioidentical hormones for about a year. Watch the bone markers, make sure they stay stable. And then, uh, uh, you know, you have to just watch bone markers over time. And you may have somebody, because you have these patients, where you can't correct a digestive problem. They're mal they're, they have malabsorption, or they, or they have horrible anxiety that just you know you just you do your best right we have those patients right and um so those folks may need more medication because they're just unable for whatever reason physically or otherwise to uh, handle what's causing the bone loss because stress and anxiety is a huge huge impact on bone so we're on lab testing, and one of the things a lot of people would like to know is, um, do I have enough calcium? And then sometimes the patients will say, well, I had my serum calcium uh, done, and it says that's normal, so I don't need calcium. Oh, boy. <laughs> Can we do another hour on this? Right. Okay, so <clears throat> in my new book, I tackled this a lot more because I don't think anyone should be taking vitamin D over 2,000, and they even would question that honestly, without taking the calcium level two. And that's because parathyroid, uh, primary hyperparathyroidism, maybe I could argue, well, before 30, early and 30 is fine, because it's more, uh, it comes on more when, as people are aging, the parathyroid issue. But uh, some people are, and the other big reason, and I can tell you I've had a lot of these people have when they take vitamin D and they're over 50 and GML, okay, the, the, the blood measurement nanograms per milliliter or nanomoles, it's too tight. You have to, I'm not going to give the, how to do the equation. Yeah, right we'll now, stick with the nano, nanograms, yeah, per nanograms per milliliter. Um, their blood calcium level will go up and you don't want that blood calcium to be on the high end of normal 
I don't like high circulating calcium. I like to see it around 9.5 or you know, 9.3, 9.5 is my sweet spot. I don't want to see these people running around with 10. I interviewed one of the top um, uh, bone, uh, excuse me, parathyroid surgeons in the country, and we compared notes. We've both, we, if you've got someone, let's say, a high end of normal calcium, that is never good. Never good. And you cannot give people more vitamin D if they have that. You have to see is it vitamin D causing it? Or is it primary hyperparathyroidism? Because she says anyone over 60 uh, with, you know, high end and normal calcium, 10, is highly suspect of having uh, an adenoma. Little, they're, they're not cancerous, but they are small tumors or enlargements of this very tiny parathyroid gland, of which there's four of them in, in the neck. So it can be either that or it can be ca- high serum calcium, in addition to that. And by the way, I also order ionized calcium. That's a, that's a basic order for me. So ionized calcium is, uh, gives us that free and available calcium. It's just a little different. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that ionized calcium, but I, I noted in your, um, in your book, you also talk about possibly a 24-hour calcium. Oh, yeah, the 24-hour urine. 24-hour urine calcium. Yeah, and, that, and that's an interesting one, too. And sometimes I will order three of them. I also interviewed one of the top um, nephrologists in the company, in the, in the country, about this. And um, sometimes I have to order three of those to get what's really going on. I, I might order the first 24-hour urine, not change anything. Don't tell them to go off calcium supplements, nothing. See what, see what it is. <clears throat> Comes back 500 or 600. Whoa. Either there's a problem or they're taking way too much calcium. So then you want to do the next one where you have them not take calcium for uh, calcium supplements or, or high calcium foods to make sure it's not a kidney problem. Now, what, what you were just saying about vitamin D, I didn't quite get. So you're saying um, <clears throat> you think it's dangerous to take too high a level of vitamin D for what reason? Abs- I think if you're going to, well, first of all, the idea that uh, I'm, I'm completely changed my viewpoint about vitamin D and how to correct a deficiency, number one. Okay. Um, but you don't, it, you know, it's a hormone, as you know, it's in the, it's in the androgen family. It's a Seiko hormone. It's a powerful hormone. So let's say somebody has been deficient for 30 years, which is likely, you know, in North America. Now all of a sudden you're giving them 10,000 a day. A lot of alternative doctors do. What's the freaking hurry? And what's going to happen when that six week hits to two months and it becomes active? Oh my goodness. It's like, just let, let's have that flood of calcium come in. Well, if you haven't corrected the anti-inflammatory, the inflammatory issues and the diet and everything else, you, that patient can end up in trouble as far as I'm concerned. So <clears throat> I go more slowly with people. If they're deficient. I give them 2000. So 1000 should increase the blood level 10 nanograms per milliliter. Um, and, uh, again, my hap, this is just me. I mean, a lot of people still feel very differently about it. I, I have to say, I get a lot of patients and they, they've gone to their MD and they had their vitamin D levels measured and they were, you know, 20 or 25 and they took a thousand and they went up to 26, you know, really did nothing. Maybe they took 2000. I find until we get them up to five or 10,000, we okay. don't really see those vitamin D levels go up to the, you know, no, that's 20, not 50, true. 60 range. That's, that's not true. Here's the problem. Okay. They have to take it with fat. Right. I understand. And, and, and they have to have no problems with digestion. So, I've done this for so long that, you know, I'm utterly convinced that either they're not getting enough fat to meal with it um, or, or the vitamin itself is incorrect. By the way, this vitamin D is uh, the, the measurement in the, what's in the bottle yeah. is commonly incorrect. Really? Yeah. I don't know if you, I can't remember the doctor's name right now. I'll remember it after we get done. But one of the most uh, notable cases, you'd know him if I, I could remember his name, uh, instead of 2,000 I use, there was 2 million. Oh, that, right. right, 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 yeah, yeah. You yeah, know yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, I, but, but the, to Gary, say, Gary, uh, uh, N, starts with an N. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. you know what? But yeah. the point is, that's how it can be wrong. So there are many things I think about with vitamin D, but if you give somebody 5,000, 
that would get them to 50. Because they're, they, if they're 20, it should get them to 70. So unless there's something wrong with the supplement or their digestion or, you know, fat, it should raise it. Okay. So you, you 2,000 vitamin D. What about taking calcium? Does calcium cause um, <clears throat> cardiovascular disease? How much calcium do they when, need? Okay. I wrote, a, I wrote an article on that. That's in the Huffington Post. When that came out years ago, my position is still the same. When they, when they go back, here's, here's what every, the doctors are saying to patients now. Get all your calcium from your food. Get all your calcium from your food. Well, I don't eat dairy. Am I getting all my calcium from my food? Do I really want to drink green smoothies that are full of oxalates? We can go way into a lot of different content here. But uh, I take calcium citrate. I do it in powder form. And when I do, when you do take calcium, you only do it in small amounts. So when they look back at those meta-analysis, Dr. Weiss, they're looking at high dosing of calcium carbonate, which is the wrong one, as we both know. Lousy form, difficult to Lousy form. form. Yeah. And they were giving it to them all at once. They never tell. So could that be the reason that it showed that some people, and they didn't remove inflammatory diets? It's just, it, it's not a functional medicine approach, shall we say, to be nice right. about it. So, so what's a moderate dosage of calcium? 200, 500? No, it's not about, it's, a, it's individual. So in my case, I do, because uh, I do no dairy, I do, and I'm a tiny, I, I eat a small amount of food. I really don't take in a lot. I'm a small person. A lot of the people who come to me are that way, so it depends on the person. But what you want to think of and how I get my patients to think, because I teach them, is that you want to get about 1,200 a day of calcium. Now, if they yeah. have Crohn's disease, if they've got something else, we might have to up it. Uh, y y again, you got to look at all the di you know, different factors for each person. But around 1,200 from all sources okay. is good. And if you are taking it, I, I try to keep it at around 200 when at I'm a every, throughout, at, at a time. And I take 600, so I'm taking it. I put, I get a, a calcium citrate, put it in water, and I drink it. Do you add magnesium at the same time? Well, uh, there's another debate. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> two to one, just, two to I one. I want to turn the what? tables on you. I want to turn <laughs> the tables on you. Um, okay, so uh, there's always that question. Should you take, does, does, do the two cancel each other out if you take it together? You know, in other words, calcium and magnesium, or do you take it separately? They, they help each other, don't they? Well, depending on who you're talking to, and I'm kind of in agreement with you. <laughs> but I see it written a lot both ways, and I've talked to a lot of chemists about this. And they said, no, really, I mean, to some extent it does. But if you also look in nature, other than dairy, you, know, you look at nettles, you look at oat straw, you look at a lot of different uh, herbs that have a lot of calcium, they always have magnesium also. And one of the biggest problems, and I know you know this, because we become gods to some patients, patients who have suffered who have suffered so much constipation because they have no magnesium. And they are just blown away that in a week we can cure that. <laughs> and more water. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of people, it's that simple, right? Yeah. Vitamin K. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> MK, MK2. Should we measure vitamin K, by the way? Should that be part of your lab panel? Eh, it doesn't, you know, that test doesn't really work. And he, I was even, I interviewed also um, the woman who wrote the book. Uh, I know Kate something, I can't remember, the vitamin K book, she wrote that okay. book. Yeah, so that test doesn't turn out to be that great. But osteocalcin, okay. osteocalcin, osteocalcin is a bit of a marker because vitamin D K increases osteocalcin activity. Honestly, I don't worry about any of that. I just want people to take it. Why do I want them to take it? Because vitamin K has been shown in multiple studies at this point, not enormous studies, but there's enough I'm convinced that M, uh, uh, vitamin K2, MK7 and MK4, I'll talk about the two, um, basically, and this is just for you know, people in the audience, but basically helps bone take up calcium and this could be the missing link when you're talking about people gobbling, taking high doses of vitamin D, they're increasing calcium absorption by 50%. And on top of it, they're taking calcium, but they're also not taking vitamin K. Right. And eating again, inflammatory foods. Is that a setup for cardio, you know, for uh, uh, 
heart and artery problems. Absolutely. Right, because one of the things that vitamin K does is it reduces the potential for arterial calcification. Right, by the method I just said. By right. the by the osteocalcin. Regulating osteocalcin, yeah. But, and the interesting thing about osteocalcin is the discovery that osteocalcin, that, the, that that was occurring in bone makes bone actually part of the endocrine system. It's a gland. It's, just, it's a rigid gland. And when you think of it that way, it, I mean, I have such respect for bone. It does so much. And most people just think it's just kind of sitting there. But it's so active. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. But then we have MK7 and MK4. Most of the supplements have MK7, but apparently most of the studies were done with MK4, right? That's right. And MK4, you'd be doing, uh, by the study, about 670 milligrams of MK4 three times a day because it doesn't stay in the system long enough. So MK7 came about and got promoted a lot through um, uh, the Can Canadian writer, and she wrote the book. I just I wish I could remember her name because I want to promote her book. Um, so vitamin K, MK7 came along and has a longer tail on it and it lasts longer in the system. Now that's in micrograms. So, and when you ever see MK4 in micrograms, it's not doing much. I mean, it's like, you know, not much. But MK7, minimum 100 milligrams a day or up to 180, you know, for some people. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, for some people, it can cause insomnia. I have heard it enough, and I just had a case last week where, you know, the patient was like, you know, I just can't sleep. I'm like, my skin's crawling. I'm just like, I cannot sleep at night. And we went back and forth with the MK7. It was definitely the MK7. I, and so I was, I've heard it enough. I've not seen studies that show this. And Kate said this too, the, the, the woman who wrote the book. She says, I've seen it enough too that I think in some people that's happening. So if you're taking MK7, do it early in the morning. But I'll tell you something. Um, in the near future, I'm doing a whole uh, webinar on the, on, the, on the MKs myself. And um, I'm leaning more towards MK4, again, as a treatment. Now, on the other hand, MK7 has a lot of cardiovascular benefits. Well, they both do. But I think MK7 has more data on the cardiovascular. It, it, well, MK4, it, it, now it's going to, it's going to, they're, they're doing the same thing by okay. the osteocalcin. Okay. I mean, so that's, it's the same route, but MK4, and MK4, by the way, is we actually produce it, and interestingly enough, in our large intestine too. Right, gut bacteria. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, not much. I mean, it doesn't do that much. But, right. uh, but MK4, as you point out, has been the most studied. And my, my view might change on it in the near future. I, I have to kind of go back and look. Every now and then, as you know, you know new stuff comes out. I got to go back and look at everything. Yeah. So um, if, if there were, um, so let's say you have somebody and you have them on a nutritional protocol and just to finish up the supplement <clears> thing, and I know once again, every one of these topics, we could talk another hour. Yeah, and I got to stop in about five minutes. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if, if there were one or two other supplements besides uh, taking vitamin D, vitamin K2, uh, calcium and magnesium, what would those be? Sometimes a protein supplement, depending on the person. I, okay. I'll tell you something. I see quite commonly in my demographic of small women, okay, that now I get, those are the prime. I get, uh, the osteoporotic patients I get are typically not diabetic. Um, I get the small women who read, who are really in, not that the diabetic people don't read. I'm just saying I get a certain demographic. And small people don't eat as much. They just right. don't. And so sometimes they need a protein uh, okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, boron, three to six milligrams a day. Okay. I want to have a full range of uh, B vitamins. I mean, I think as you do, <clears throat> you and I are both going to go over diet, try to get as much as we can people to look at diet and to get as much as they can from diet. And then we supplement from there. Um, and there's so... I mean, there's so many things you have to discover about bone. But for instance, you know, B12 is another one. B12 is important for bone. And B12, we now also know that if it's too high, is not good 
for bone. Okay. And, and I keep learning that one too. So I like I like to see B12 kind of in the upper uh, three fourths of the range, hmm. but not high anymore. You know, I used to. I, think I have fun. to say, when we do serum B12 and B6, I'm seeing a lot of people high. Me too. And B6, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned that because we now know that B6, you've got to go off of all B6 for about three or four days before you get tested for thyroid as well as that CTX. So I, I you know. You've got to go off of B6 before t- thyroid testing? Yeah, and also CTX. Now, uh, really? thyroid, we thought about that was true for a long time, but Quest just came out with this in terms of the. CTX tested, it's influencing that. So I, I tend to take people off of supplements unless it's really important for them to be off of it for a couple of days at least anyway, because I just don't want anything to influence the test if possible. Oh, interesting. Before lab testing. And make sure that they drink water the day of the test. Right. If people think fasting, they're not drinking, you know, you have to drink water or the test can be off. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, touch on next because I know we got a minute or two. Strontium fluoride, those are two substances that are. I'm not a fan of strontium. And not a fan of strontium. Okay. I'm not. And for a couple, well, for a lot of reasons, but one is, is that it gives false readings with uh, bone density. Um, much higher uh, false readings than we thought. And um, so you can't really trust uh, bone densities once somebody's starting strontium. So the question is, how good is the fracture reduction? Because it's not that that's really what you're always looking at. Right. Um, and there's other issues in terms of heart potential and some other things with strontium. I just don't see the need when I feel I've got much more data on the other medications when needed. And I don't, and when somebody's borderline, I don't see the need for anything. I see the need for nutrition and, you know, a lot of other things. So, um, yeah, I just wouldn't use it. Okay. And it's strontium citrate. That's what's typically. Okay. And what do you think about fluoride? Um, Yeah, don't take fluoride. Okay. I'm not (laughs) a big fan either. Well, fluoride, you know, uh, natural occurring fluoride. Fluoride, you know, helps bone. I mean, to some extent, the tiny amount we get in foods and all of that um, helps bone. Yeah, Um, but it kind of just replaces the calcium, right? Well, so does strontium. That's, by the way, that's what it does. It replaces calcium. Um, So you better think that's a good idea. And that's what I always say. You better better think that that fluoride or strontium is better than calcium in the bone. And I just can't go there with it. Right. You know, so, no, I'm not a fan. Okay. So I guess that'll be a wrap. Yeah. (laughs) Um, any final words um, and best way to get in contact with you to well, find out yeah, about I, you and your programs? Uh, you know, I do have a master class. People can join that. And I, I do webinars uh, that are strong teaching thing. You know, I have slides and the whole thing. Um, I'll be doing a mentoring program in the fall. Um, and, um, you know, I hope that people go oh, and then again, they're going to get a discount because you're going to send them that in terms of my books. Yep. And I also have videos over there, like on fractures, individual things that are, you know, I think very high quality teaching tools. And what's the website? Uh, Lani, L-A-N-I, Simpson, S-I-M-P-S-O-N, dot com. There you go. Thank you, Lonnie.